Okay, so welcome everyone. And today we're going to do a little presentation on EPR in Maryland and how it might or might not affect our residential recycling programs. My name is Peter Haustel. I am the Maryland Recycling Network's Executive Director. And shortly we will turn the conversation over to our, our panelists and presenters. But before we do, I'd like to just ask a couple of things of you. Uh, first of all, we're going to have a conference sometime this year. Theoretically, we're scheduled for Thursday, June 24th at the BWI Marriott. Of course, that assumes that things are going to change quite a bit, which maybe they will, maybe they won't. We don't quite know yet, but we're fingers crossed. Uh, that said, we're going to have something, and it likely will be a virtual conference, but we will have a conference of some flavor or other in June. Uh, so then I also want to let you know that we hope and expect you to be active participants in our conversation today. So we have some options for you to chat or provide, uh, share questions with us or potentially get on the microphone. And then I also want to let everybody know that we will be recording this web webinar and posting a copy of the recording to our website probably by the end of the week at the latest, maybe sooner, and I'll be sending out an email to everyone to let you know when that is available. Um, so, in terms of your participation, it's fairly straightforward. On your Zoom screen, you're going to see some icons, chat, you can raise your hand, you can click the Q&A button. If you click the chat button, it'll open a window where you can type in a question. If you click the raise your hand, you, it, I'll see your hand raised and potentially we could, could give you a chance to speak. Uh, or you can also use the Q&A or question and answer option where you can put in a question which we could then answer. So those are your, really your, your three key options here. And then of course, I want to make sure that everybody understands that the Maryland Recycling Network survives only because of the support of its members. Hmm, does this sound like a familiar refrain? Uh, yes, just like NPR, PBS, etc. And we really want to thank our patrons who and, and sustaining members whose financial support uh, helps helps keep the doors open, as it were. But we really rely on all of our members to to help out. So for those of you who have not made that step into membership, I highly recommend and urge and and plead for you to do so. It's real easy. You can go on the website and just click join today and, and we can get you all set up. Then moving forward, uh, I do think that life is too, <laughs> we take life too seriously sometimes. So we need to have a reason to smile on occasion. And before we go any further with this presentation, just want to let you know how I've felt of late. <laughs> so that said, I want to do a quick poll with everybody before we get started. Real simple question for you. Based on what you currently know, do you think EPR is a viable option for Maryland? Yes, no, maybe, have no idea. And the uh, answers are coming in strong and heavy. Well, yes is, is, is slightly ahead of maybe, um, only one knows so far. And this is kind of like popcorn in the microwave, you're waiting for it to sort of fade out and stop popping. And, and just a minute here, I'm going to give this another second or two, and then we're going to go with the results we've got so far. Um, so let's take a look at what people have said. And it looks like the majority, 54%, agree that EPR is a, a viable option for Maryland. And 45% are sort of <laughs> hedging their bets. And, and there, there's 1% who are going, eh, don't think so. So that said, we're going to ask this same question after we, we get through our conversation today and see perhaps what, uh, what minds were changed one way or the other. But in order for us to get started, we really need to understand what the, the legislation looks like and, and, and perhaps what, uh, in this case, a Delegate Brooke Learman from Montgomery County suggests is the option we should consider. So I want to turn the microphone over at this point. To, to Brooke and uh, Danny DiPietro, if she, if she joins in. So uh, Brooke, it's all yours. Great, thank you so much. Uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you so much um, for having me. Thanks for organizing. And thanks to everybody who's joining today uh, for all of your work and your coordination. I, you know, as a Marylander who cares about recycling, I really appreciate it and appreciate the work that you do. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, uh, let's see, um, here we go. Um, and I'm going to go just go through a little bit about um, extended producer responsibility. And I want to be clear, and I think it's important to remember that EPR already exists, right? It already exists for certain kinds of products. Um, the all EPR is is saying, you know what? If you produce something, you should be responsible for it longer than the time it takes to get from your production facility 
onto a truck, right? You should have a little bit more skin in the game um, and make it, to make sure that you have the right incentives that are aligned for your production. And we're already doing this for, you know, batteries and in some places they, you know, do it for uh, syringes and other healthcare type products. This year, last year, we passed through the House of Delegates a paint care bill. This year, we, we're going to pass it again through the House, you know, paint EPR, the kind of EPR that I'm talking about um, and that my bill, HB 36, looks at is and addresses is EPR for packaging. Um, it's a specific kind. So I just want to make clear that when we say EPR, it's a broad term. It means a whole bunch of different types of, uh, of products, but what I'm talking about is EPR for packaging. Um, so as we see here, you know, EPR already applies to many products in Maryland, like batteries and products like tin mercury. EPR is all about really shifting the cost and responsibility of waste management and recycling. Where it is right now, it's just on taxpayers and local governments. There's no skin in the game at all for producers. And, you know, existing EPR programs are like take back programs where, you know, if you have to, you know, if you're diabetic or you have to take insulin or you have some other form of shot, you can get a canister and you just mail it right back to them. So they take everything back. Same with batteries and others, uh, other types of products with mercury. And that's how it'll be for paint as well. They will be, there will be a take back program that the paint producers stand up. This bill um, is a little bit different in that it is about retaining our current waste and recycling systems and really asking producers to contribute financially to the costs of recycling, um, not just to maintain what we have, and we'll talk about this more, but to make it better. So in HB 36, what we're talking about are packaging and containers, consumer products, service packaging, medicine bottles, paper products, except for bound books, uh, there's some back and forth about whether bottles should be included in this since we don't have a bottle bill in different uh, in different provinces and different places around the world. Some places have EPR and bottles separately. Some places do it together. So there's different different ways to do that as well. Who's a producer? A producer is somebody who manufactures, sells, distributes, or imports covered product, the covered product under its own name or brand in Maryland, or imports the covered product as a licensee or franchisee who sells or distributes it in Maryland. So it's a very specific type of person, uh, type of off, uh, uh, company. In the bill, there are several different, uh, different terms that you'll hear. And these are very foreign terms to me when I first heard them. I was like, what does this mean? Um, and especially, you know, some of the groups, they, everybody operates by acronyms. So people would be telling me about the PSO and the PSP. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but now I understand. So the first is the PSO, the Product Stewardship Organization. This is a non, this would be a nonprofit organization that's created by a group of producers to implement the stewardship plan. Notably, there could be more than one. So it may be that some producers say, okay, we're gonna handle these types of products and we're gonna produce, we're gonna create our own stewardship organization. Another group of producers could say, well, okay, we're gonna handle these other groups of products and we're gonna cover an organization. And then each of those, um, they would work together. Um, they would develop either their own or one product stewardship plan. And that plan would be, that's really where the rubber meets the road, right? The statute itself is not going to be the place that has all of the details for how an EPR system in Maryland works. I just, I don't believe that, you know, in 90 days <laughs> we can uh, we can or should put the level of detail that's required in a plan into state statute. And I think that's important because statutes should allow for evolution and growth. And we don't want to have a statute that inhibits growth, that inhibits creativity, and that inhibits, you know, concerned citizens, MDE, you know, producers and others from working together to create the best system, um, even if it was one that perhaps I or you or others who were involved in creating the legislation didn't foresee because times change. So the main goals of this EPR bill and an EPR for packaging bill are, of course, waste reduction and helping lo local governments cover costs associated with managing residential waste and recycling. Um, this is really about, so I am a big believer in helping to make sure that we are reducing our reliance on single use plastics, that we're doing, reducing our reliance on single use packaging. Um, and we are seeing an explosion right now, frankly, in single use packaging and single use plastics, because of course, 
you know, fossil fuels have hit rock bottom prices and that's what plastics are coming from. And so we are seeing right now and we are gonna continue to see it until we start implementing a bat, you know, some sort of uh, contravening force against it. We are seeing completely supply driven uh, production of plastic at this point. No, nobody's saying, oh my gosh, I really need more clamshell, like hard plastic clamshells to cover my, uh, my lettuce when I buy it or my apples or whatever it is. But producers are going to continue to make more things in single use plastic containers and use more and different types of plastic because plastic is just so cheap to make. And until we come up with a way to, um, to countervene that, uh, that affordability of the product, there's not going to be a reason that producers should stop doing that. And so at the end of the day, this really is about um, both helping our local governments and thinking through more long-term and holistic changing of the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like changing of the, uh, of, you know, the, um, I'm blanking on the word I'm looking for, but making it cost more for producers, making them think again about how, uh, how cheap it is to put all these single-use plastics into the waste stream. So the process is that producers work together and they create a stewardship organization, and then they submit that stewardship, then they create a plan uh, through that stewardship organization, and they submit that plan to MDE. So what's in the plan? It lists everybody, all the producers and brands that are covered by the plan. It has to have performance goals, so waste reductions of certain products, and by material type. You know, if you are, and we'll get to this in the fees, but there's a difference between creating a product that's entirely paper and creating a, a product that's three different kinds of plastic all in one, right? Um, that's sort of the easiest to recycle and the most impossible to recycle types of products. And then there's a lot of variability in between. The implementation plan, they need to tell us how their performance goals are gonna be met or exceeded and there has to be stakeholder involvement. So working with local governments, working with you all, working with haulers, working with all those who are engaged in this process already and know how it works, working with them to understand how it works. Staffing, how the staffing administration of the plan will be handled, the product design, how producers will work together to reduce packaging through better product design. So right, maybe your uh, you know, detergent bottle has four different types of plastic in it right now. We need to talk about the fact that that should have one type of plastic in it and it should be a type of plastic that we can recycle. Um, and they have to do public outreach and communication, right? There has to be a way to make sure that people know what can be recycled um, and, and to prevent contamination. Um, so financing. So there's different methods of financing depending on the plan. Um, there's a fee, you know, fees that are collected uh, and used to cover costs of operating the product stewardship organization and to reimburse and provide grants to local governments. Um, there will also be a method for reimbursing local governments. You know, this will be in the plan for costs associated with transporting and processing covered materials. And there need to be incentives and disincentives, right? The fee structure has to be one that is, um, that incentivizes a company to move from three different kinds of plastic in one bottle to one type of plastic in one bottle. And then maybe from a type of plastic that isn't recyclable to one that is recyclable. And then, oh my gosh, maybe that it doesn't even need to be plastic. Maybe it can be um, some other form, some other product that is much more recyclable. And oh my gosh, what if someday it's, you know, doesn't even need to be, um, it can be composted or something. So we just need to keep making sure that there are incentives to encourage producers to reduce waste and improve recyclability um, through product design. And the incentive is that they should have to pay less fees, fewer fees, um, or a lower amount, uh, a lower number, if their if their product is designed in a way that reduces waste. So here, I won't I I won't go through all of these, but as you may know, um, EPR for packaging exists in most Western countries, including Canada, all of Europe, much of South America. Um, some of Asia, it, it's, we're, the, we're the exception to the rule, sadly. And there are different countries that make their fee structure you know, ha different. So in Italy, you know, it's about making it easier to recycle. Um, in France, it's about source reduction, you get a bonus. So there's all these different ways to, to incentivize or disincentivize behavior from producers based on fees. Um, this is how the reimbursement structure works in Canada. Um, their different provinces have different models. So 
um, in Quebec and Manitoba and British Columbia and Ontario, there's you know, different models of reimbursement um, to the local governments. And this is Quebec. Um, so different, you know, within Quebec, sort of looking at the different costs, and this is all in US dollars, the average reimbursement um, and the estimated reimbursement per municipality. Um, so, and you have over here the type, you know, whether it's a large rural or a large metro area. Um, so I think this provides a good understanding of what is possible. Um, so accountability is obviously very important. Um, you know, these are private, uh, this is a private nonprofit, this product stewardship organization, but it would have to submit regular reporting to MDE, would have to maintain a public website so people understood what it was doing, who was involved. There would be, and the, and the hook, <laughs> of course, or the hammer, is that you can't sell, import, or distribute if you're not a part of the PSO, or you haven't submitted your independent, an independent plan. Say you're your own company and you have one type of one type of product that you're selling, you can create your own plan if you want to, um, but you have to have that plan and MDE has to approve it. Otherwise you are not allowed to sell, import or distribute that product in Maryland. Um, and that's it. So try to be brief because I know you have a lot of great people speaking today, but that's about this uh, That's about this bill. And I should also add that, you know, this bill really came to us. Um, I did not go out in search of another bill, but many local governments, I chaired a work group this session or this interim on waste reduction and recycling. And we had multiple local governments answer a survey to us when they answered a survey to us, tell us that they wanted to see EPR for packaging, that this was on their wish list of things that they wanted to see. And, you know, when I was doing a walk around with the head of DPW, um, or the, in Baltimore City, the Department of Public Works, the head of uh, solid waste management. And you know, we had a long discussion about all the things that DPW could do if it had more money to update its recycling, to update its collection, to up, you know, just to modernize in so many ways. And you know, he was very honest that they just don't have the funds you know, at this point and they're not making the money from recycling. And it just feels like there's no end in sight and there's no light at the end of the tunnel right now. And so when we started talking about EPR, it was sort of like, wow, that would be the light at the end of the tunnel because that would create a process through which this whole system could improve rather than just being stagnant. And that's something I'm excited about. So thank you so much for having me today. I'm always open for feedback and ideas. Great to have you. Thank you. Thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, and before we go further, I just want to apologize for some reason or other. I think I suggested you were from Montgomery County. I actually yeah. grew up in Baltimore City, and I always thought Baltimore was in Montgomery County. I don't know why I thought that. <laughs> well, actually, I am originally from Montgomery County. I went to. <laughs> I knew there was a Montgomery I County. I represent Baltimore County. City. So. <laughs> so, speaking of the voice of the, the municipal and county uh, folks, I I'd like to start with perhaps you can hear from Michelle Blair. Michelle, if you can share sort of your reaction to what you've heard today. And and, and what, how you think this might play out in a city like Laurel. Sure. Okay, hi, I'm Michelle Blair. I work for the city of Laurel, Department of Public Works. I'm the recycling coordinator uh, for the city. And I just wanted to say, I'm very happy to see this kind of legislation um, being introduced to uh, address producer responsibility for their packaging um, as a small municipality. Uh, we are inundated, especially during this uh, period of COVID, with a lot of people throwing a lot of things out in our recycling. Um, as a background, Laurel provides recycling services for our, um, for our residents uh, with our own crews, our own trucks. Um, we provide recycling containers to our residents, as well as annual educational calendars um, that highlight reduce, reuse, and recycle. And uh, so we're, we uh, provide recycling for uh, a little bit over almost 7,000 residents uh, once a week, our townhomes and single, ha uh, single family homes. So when I read this, again, I, I think this is a, a, an excellent starting point to a long awaited and much needed conversation of how producers can support uh, local governments, especially smaller municipalities, as we as we struggle with recycling. Um, I'm not sure how we would get reimbursed. Again, uh, the city of Laurel is pretty independent when we when it comes to uh, providing recycling services. 
we had a longstanding relationship with the private hauler. We also use the county MRF. Uh, we use the county MRF much more frequently now. So I'm concerned or the question uh, that I would ask is, um, are we going to be told by the, uh, the stewardship participants that we have to go to a certain place? Um, the other question is, uh, I would rather see more of a grant program as we have to continue to expand our recycling programs um, to provide a way for us to sustain not only the level that we have now with providing containers, um, but also to expand our education efforts and how that would, um, how that would work in this new legislation. Or do you want me to respond or? Well, uh, I don't know, Peter. Do we want to wait until the until the end? Yeah, let's let's keep walking. We've got cool. a couple more folks to hear from. Let's let's sort of aggregate their questions and then um, then keep keep. Mm -hmm. So I want to I want to jump around a little bit here since we're on the county municipality uh, cruise. Let's uh, go to Adam Ortiz from Montgomery County, who's actually from Montgomery County. <laughs> Adam. Thanks everybody, good to see you. Thanks for the organizers and thank you everybody for being here today. Uh, Adam Ortiz, uh, Director of uh, uh, Montgomery County's Department of Environmental Protection, but long time Prince George's resident as well and familiar with the systems there. Um, you know, we're really excited to have this conversation. This is only sort of a natural evolution of, you know, things that implicitly we know a problem that we implicitly experience all the time, but we know that we're not quite getting our hands around it. So um, you're representing a local government, you know, especially when it comes to, you know, waste and trash and recycling, we're the backstop, you know, whatever happens in our disposable consumer society, you know, we all buy stuff, we all throw things away, you know, sometimes it ends up on the side of the road. At the end of the day, it's the government that is still cleaning up the mess because nobody else is cleaning it up. And by the government, I mean that you are cleaning up the mess. I am cleaning up the mess because we're all funding the government. So, um, so it's about time that we're in the mix. So a little bit from the, the government perspective or the taxpayer perspective, you know, we are really saddled with the tremendous burden um, of this disposable and non-recyclable um, economy. So I'm so, so, so glad that Delegate Learman is, you know, uh, championing uh, this issue. We know it's going to be a big one. It might take several years, but it's a conversation that's long overdue. So, you know, we deal with this stuff on the recycling stream, which is mostly what, what we've been talking about today. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, um, but also on the litter stream. So there's a lot of stuff that ends up, you know, about between one and 2% of taxpayers litter or people litter and the rest of us are cleaning up after that. So just to give you an idea, um, we are in charge of the, the governments, all of you, on making sure that we have clean waters. We have to pick up trash. We have to regulate it because that's a command from uh, the Clean Water Act, from the EPA. It's also public expectation. People don't want to see trash on the side of the road. They don't want to see trash in their neighborhoods. So, you know, it, it's incumbent on departments of transportation, all of us, to clean it up, to pick it up, whether it's, you know, in, in the stream through trash traps um, or, you know, public works or street sweeping, you know, tremendous cost there. Utilities, when it washes into the storm drain, it can clog the storm drain. So then, you know, all of our local water utilities are literally spending millions cleaning this stuff and then recycling. Some, all plastics are not equal, my friends. And just as an example, um, so we have two cups here. They look identical, they perform identically. I field tested them myself before this presentation. Uh, but this one is a number two plastic. This number two plastic is worth about $270 a ton when we collect it at the recycling center and we sell it. We try to bundle them together. We get um, uh, plastics processors to, to purchase this stuff, about $270 a ton. This one looks identical as a number six plastic. This one is worth $0. This is worth nothing. We can't get buyers for it. So we end up um, losing um, about $80 a ton. That's how much it costs to run um, the recycling center. So taxpayers, you, are losing $80 when we're, when we're getting this stuff in the stream, we're making about $270 in the stream. Similarly, we're talking about packaging, um, tail two packages. So this um, is uh, two packages from Amazon. 
Um, this is um, you know, plastic film. You know, we're all familiar with this. And thank you, Delegate Thurman, for your leadership on uh, banning plastic bags. So this is not recyclable unless you take it to the grocery store. But even then, there's some questions. But when we get this in the trash, it's a cost of about $50 a ton to process. This is a new package that Amazon is actually um, rolling out um, to the point of EPR. Uh, this one is uh, made out of paper. Um, it actually has like some squishy um, foam looking stuff, but this is actually made out of rice and uh, disintegrates in water when it's processed. And uh, we can treat this as a paper product uh, and we can sell this for about $50 a ton. So we have two packages, they perform the same function, but this one makes money for us. This one loses money. So Adam, if I can jump in here real quickly, I want to make sure we get a chance to hear from, from Chaz and Neil. So if we can circle back, because I think you've got some great points here with respect to the issues of the packaging and the cost of processing or potentially making money from them. But I want to make sure we get to hear from those two. So if I can just pause here and, and uh, hand the mic over to, to, uh, to Neil Seldman, uh, just to give us a quick overview of what he thinks, what he heard from uh, Delegate Learman today and what he thinks of the legislation as a process, uh, a way forward. Uh, Neil? Thank you. Um, and I want to thank uh, the Maryland Network for hosting, Recycling Network for hosting this. And I want to thank Dele uh, Delegate uh, Learman for putting in the time. And I know, I know it takes a lot of time to put these bills together. Um, I think the bill is very good. I think it's a model. New York State and Maine have similar bills. The key for me is that it calls for municipal reimbursement. This is a way for cities, as, as the delegate said, to break out of the stagnation we've had for 15 or 20 years and not only support the existing systems, but give them the, the local officials the, uh, the leeway to grow and, um, and change. I think it's important that Maryland and the other states are taking this view, uh, this point of view, because the alternative would be to create an EPR system in which the corporations uh, dominate, the large corporations dominate the decision making. And I'd like to introduce a term, I'll call it the economy of small scale, because I believe small scale processing is more efficient. And I could give uh, processing and marketing, um, and I could give an example from Maryland. Uh, right now, um, uh, in my opinion, we could discuss this uh, an optimal size for composting and, and recycling processing is about three to 400, maybe 500 tons per day. But um, in, in Elk Ridge, we've got a facility that's running at around 900 to 1,000 per day and not giving very much processing, uh, successful processing. Glass cannot be recovered. That's 20% of the waste stream, of the recycle stream, excuse me. And I think that by supporting local government, we're going to see um, advancement in creativity. Uh, cities will be able to uh, uh, do uh, demonstrations or pilots uh, with unit pricing, uh, co-collection, bi-weekly collection. There's a whole array of strategies and tactics that local officials have been rolling out very successfully across the country, uh, composting as well. Um, so by creating a system in Maryland where local government cities and counties have a steady uh, revenue uh, to compensate them for handling the materials that the producers are, are putting into, into uh, the consumption stream, the waste stream that winds up in the waste stream. I think this is the, the best way to battle it. Um, I think also, and I'll end here because I, I know we want to have discussion more than anything. Um, the one place where, um, where uh, the corporate model has been implemented and is operating is British Columbia. Uh, in uh, Canada a province, and uh, there's been a lot of good detailed criticism of that system, uh, mainly because it depends on incineration and it uh, tends to undermine the existing bottle bills. And I know that Delegate Learman has taken, uh, has focused on the need for both uh, this EPR with municipal reimbursement as well as a bottle bill for the state of Maryland. And I think this legislation is, uh, is groundbreaking, uh, it, taking us in the right direction in Maryland. And as I said, helping other states um, look at it in the proper way. Excellent, thank you, Neil. Uh, so I guess to, to use a spring metaphor, uh, Chaz, your turn to bat cleanup. <laughs> uh, thanks, and, and uh, somebody put in the question and answer, this is HB 36, uh, the delegate Lerman introduced. 
And you know, she talked about the, the idea is, is to get money to local governments to help cover the cost of managing our, our waste and recycling. Who could possibly object to that? But the key issue in Maryland and probably the other 49 states is who pays and how we pay for recycling. Mm -hmm. All recycling programs in Maryland are not paid for by taxes. Uh, Baltimore City and Baltimore County do use taxes to pay for all their costs. The four counties in the I-95 corridor between Baltimore and Washington use a fee system. That means because I pay a fee in Montgomery County, my fee will automatically go down if the county benefits gets money from the producers. Hey, that works for me. <laughs> Taxpayers will not get that benefit. Uh, Frederick also uses a fee, but the other counties in Maryland tend to rely on subscription haulers in the unincorporated parts of the county to do the waste and recycling. In that situation, it's the individual residents who pay through their monthly contract fee to that subscription hauler for the recycling service. There are some county taxes used. They're for education or maybe bins or maybe getting recyclables to a, uh, a, 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 a processing facility, but not a lot of tax money. Now the municipalities vary. Some of them will use the tax base to pay for the recycling programs. I think that's true in the larger ones, but the smaller municipalities are by and large simply going to be doing the subscription route. And again, taxes really are not that much used. So we need to get it into the Maryland context. We, we need to do something for Maryland, not something that, that was, was, was started for other parts of the world. Uh, be, because the reality is the EPR programs in Canada, and it's, only, it's not in all of Canada, it's only, five, it's only in five provinces, uh, and in Europe, are in a backdrop that is so different from what we see in this country. And we really only have one chance to do it right because it's very hard to do a makeover as the residents of the, of the province of Ontario are finding out as they totally redo their system to avoid having a single producer group because they don't want the monopoly, the kind of monopoly issues Neil, uh, Neil referred to. There's also going to be issues in Maryland because while most of the county does single stream, Montgomery County does dual stream and we see a lot of dual stream drop off in rural parts of the county. I don't know of any producer uh, programs in the world that do both. Uh, there, there may be some that exist, but it'll be interesting to find out. So let's just, uh, I'll stop with that and, and let's have some good conversation and some good questions. Go for it, Peter. Okay, so uh, Delegate Learman, you've had a chance to hear from uh, four people here and obviously there are lots of moving parts and lots of questions hiding in each of those nooks and crannies. Perhaps you wanna to respond to anything that struck you as you were listening. And by sure, the way, yeah, thank no. you very much for all the Q&A responding you've been doing. You're obviously a Zoom pro, so I'm-, I'm Sure, I'm trying, really I'm trying to type know. in those answers. Yep. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, this is a great discussion and I think it's a really important one to have. And I've appreciated having calls and emails with many of the folks on this call throughout the development of the legislation. You know, I guess first I'll say, um, this wasn't a bill um, that we just imported from British Columbia or Canada or that was made for somebody else, um, Chaz. <laughs> we wrote this bill. <laughs> um, and it is, uh, it is certainly, I think, has a lot of different parts if you look at it. Well, first I'll say, you know, Maine's bill, New York's bill, those are 50 page plus bills, right? Those are, that is not the kind of legislation that we pass in Maryland. We just don't, we never will. Um, and so in Maryland, what we do is we put out general guidelines <laughs> through statutes and then, the, and then we go to, through a regulatory process. Um, we go to MDE, we go to the, we work with MAKO, we work with MML, we work with other governments and the, and the, and the regulatory process is, is really where a lot of the details are as it should be. Um, I also think it's interesting, you know, one of the things that I think is true in Maryland is because we don't pass 50 page bills, unless it's the blueprint for Maryland's future that took four years to develop um, through a high level commission, uh, the Kerwin Commission, we are able to amend things. So while it's very different, difficult for Ontario perhaps to amend its legislation because they've been working on it for a while, the nice thing in Maryland is that we meet every year and we do often tweak programs. Um, you know, I would say, uh, you know, many of the bills that we have coming through Maryland are tweaks to programs created years ago. And that's because, as it should be, right? We live and learn. 
And so I'm really excited about starting this conversation this year and hopefully, you know, continuing it next year. Uh, and it's at some point, hopefully sooner rather than later, passing someplace to start because it's difficult. I, you know, this is such a complex piece of legislation, but we have to keep it as simple as possible in statutory form. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, you know, I'm always open to ideas. And uh, you know, we certainly know municipality, all the municipalities and counties in the state are different, as you noted, they're, you know, different structures. And so what we want to do is make sure that we keep it broad enough, keep the bill broad enough so that it can be applicable to all the different types of structures that exist within the state of Maryland. If we were to specify too, in a too detailed a fashion in the bill, how to do each one, then it wouldn't leave any room for creativity or growth or change. Um, because it may be that some counties, you know, operate on a fee system now, but they would wanna move to a tax system or some t places move on a tax system and they wanna change it and go to fees. But we, if we get too detailed in the statute, then we foreclose uh, possibilities for change and evolution. So um, I really appreciate all the points that were made. Michelle, as well, I think you made some great points about immoral, how things work. And um, I think that's really important to keep in mind. And I think, you know, my hope is that the bill is broad enough that there's flexibility um, to work with the situation that you described as well, but delighted to have a follow-up conversation um, to understand better the challenges there too. So, but thank you. This is a great discussion and really important points raised. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Adam, I sort of chopped you off a little early there, but I didn't know if you had any, any questions you might want to follow up with a delegate uh, while you got her here and got her full attention. Oh, thanks, Peter. Well, first I want to thank you. That was the most polite hook I've received um, in a long time for, for speaking too long. So, so very grateful for that. Very gentle. Um, you know, well, well, here's the issue, and I, you know, and I welcome the delegate to comment. Is that as I mentioned, and you know, I'm sensitive to Chaz's point that there's different systems, but it, at the end of the way, at the end of the day, the public is paying one way or another, and the bills are huge. Um, you know, just litter alone is between five and fifteen million dollars a year in cleanup for big jurisdictions. Recycling systems are losing millions, and even if it's private, that means that they're charging um, the public more to make up that difference. So the public, in one way, or the government, or these systems, are like bearing this burden, uh, but who's not helping bear the burden? The manufacturers are not. They're not at the table at all. They're not part of the solution. And, you know, and I grant that, you know, many of them, you know, uh, participate in uh, Keep America Beautiful and provide grants to jurisdictions for receptacles. And that's really important. Um, but, you know, but they are not, you know, at the table as a major uh, part of the system of change, of solution. You know, Coke, I pulled up um, uh, Coca-Cola, we've been in discussions in Montgomery with Coke and Pepsi. Coke has pledged a world without waste. Um, the beverage um, uh, uh, industry has pledged every bottle back. So they know that this is an issue. And I think that, you know, delegate, you would welcome that participation, that engagement from them to do something meaningful because my understanding is that they have those structural relationships for the solution in other places. Yeah, I think that's right. So any, anybody else have a, a question or comment you'd like to make uh, among our panelists? Um, I, I would like to just say, I, I think that it's so huge. The whole thing is so huge. And one size is not gonna fit all. And that is, that's the exciting part of it is that we all can have a, a say in creating the solution. Um, to say to a manufacturer, uh, you need to reduce the type of, of plastic that you're using for, your, say, your Tide bottle or something, um, or you're not going to be able to, se uh, to sell in Maryland is, is really, I don't know how realistic that is, as opposed to focusing on something specific and measurable like uh, plastic, you know, the plastic that goes over the, the water bottles, the single-use water bottles. But and, and saying to the manufacturer, okay, you're going to continue to use this. We as a municipality or a county in the state of Maryland are now going to require you to be part of the stewardship to, to say to us, how are we going to safely, economically um, take this out of our waste stream? How are we going to put this in a place where it can be recycled into something else? 
And so instead of, instead of focusing on the revenue, focusing on a, a means to actually implement that through uh, a different type of collection system that, that, that they would fund, you know, something tangible um, and, and start rolling that out and then start changing or trying to change the mindset and the culture. If we have a win, if we say Maryland has designed this and we're getting the feedback from the manufacturers, then the manufacturers in the long run will then start saying, well, maybe we need to, to change our thinking about our packaging um, instead of trying to do the, the whole thing. Again, as a very small municipality, what I need is I need assistance to keep my programs running um, as opposed to saying, you know, for every hundred ton that you're not going to take to the MRF, you'll get 20 cents. I mean, that to me, that's not realistic. What's realistic is, is there a container that I can... Um, that I can give to my residents? Is there a way that I can promote taking plastic out of the waste stream and putting it somewhere where it's going to get smushed into something else like tracks or something? Those kind of things are tangible and it means something. And I think it will translate better into um, a long-term solution. So Michelle, let's let's uh, turn back to the delegate. Uh, do you think a more incremental approach, perhaps with more some, some more direct support would, uh be a, uh, an option here? Um, I'd love to know what that looks like. I mean, it, to have the producers at the table, um, to have them willing to engage, I think they want a more holistic solution, right? They want to say, okay, we're going to come up with a plan. We're going to work on these issues, you know, on this packaging. And so here's what we need to see. Here's what you want to see. Here's sort of the midway point where we can all meet. Uh, and we can live with it, right? And um, we don't want to have to keep, you know, we want to have certainty um, because they have shareholders <laughs> that they have to appease, right? And so what they need is certainty. Um, and so they need to have some ability to make a plan, to rely on it, to know that it's going to be settled for the next few years um, and to do it in a more holistic way, I think. I think it's, it also might be tough to sort of pick one type of packaging at a time because there are so, because most of the organ, most of the companies are represented by organizations, and they want to sort of all go in together. So you know whether that's Ameripen, which is the biggest one, or Flexible Packaging Institute, which is another really large one, which is actually based here in Maryland. Um, they want to be, they want to have, they want to bring their members together. Um, and, you know, I, so I guess that's what I'm hearing from them. Um, I know not everybody will agree, but that's just what I'm hearing from them. But I don't think it's about putting the burden onto municipalities either, right? And this isn't mm -hmm. about putting a burden onto MDE. Part of this and part of the implementation idea is that in the plan, you're paying, they are paying to help with the staffing, right? They are paying to help. If MDE needs to hire three new people to oversee this, that has to be paid for by the producers. That's part of what it costs to stand up an EPR program. And all of those costs are a part of our, our, our fair game <laughs> for being paid for uh, by the producers. Um, so I think that you know this should not be a burden. I mean, I think of this as, um, yeah, I, I, it, shouldn't be, it shouldn't ever be a burden on local governments. It should be something that is helpful to them. It should be, it should give them ability to be creative and to think differently um, about, you know, implementing new plans. Yeah, I, I'd like to throw in one thought and, and the, the comments about taxes and fees and all those subscription haulers out there, that's a real world reality that the producers, I think, are totally clueless about because they have no experience with this in other parts of the world. So we are creating something from whole cloth in Maryland. And it's going to take time to do that. I know that the, the uh, fiscal note was five new employees at MDE to, to manage this. I think they're going to need more than that. And they're going to need some fairly sophisticated economists because the one reality of a producer group, they want control and they want to spend as little money as possible. They're, they're not like a bank writing a check for everybody. And a failure to appreciate that, I think, is going to create some serious problems. And in particular, this whole issue of how do we 
we go into, it's, it's about, I don't know, 18, 17, 18 communities, counties in Maryland that rely so heavily on subscription systems. What happens to those companies? Will they still be able to collect waste and gar uh, recycling? What nobody knows because we've never dealt with that situation with an EPR kind of program. And that has to be taken very seriously and thought through. Because these are companies, Maryland companies, whose operations are at stake. And, and it's these kinds of things we need to figure out and we need to figure out how we can, we can anticipate them. If I could step into the audience for just a minute, um, uh, Pam Kassemeyer, who is a longtime member of, of the network, uh, is among the audience, and uh, she asked to raise her hand, and perhaps I'm, I'm curious to what she might add to the conversation since she's been around this conversation for a while. Pam? I think you might be muted, so let's see if that works. If that doesn't work, we'll, we'll move on, because sometimes technology is our friend, and sometimes not so much. It does not look like Pam, but it's yeah, right. <laughs> okay, Maybe so I, Pam might be having an issue with the uh, with the technology. So I want to go to a question that came from the audience uh, when they registered, and somebody was asking, "Where does the consumer fit into this conversation? Um, uh, what's their role in in EPR?" Uh, Delegate, would you care to answer that, or try to answer that? Sorry, where does what fit in the situation? Where does the consumer fit? In the conversation. Oh, well, <laughs> I mean, to me, this is so this is about the consumer. <laughs> I mean, this is about whether they're, you know, paying fees or taxes or subscription services, whether, you know, they see litter and plastic all over their neighborhoods and in our waterways, right? Ultimately, making sure we're reducing waste and improving our waste waste systems and improving our recycle recycling systems is a huge boon for the consumer. I mean, this is, to me, the consumer is at the center of all of this. Um, and it's, you know, a hugely important piece of this. And so I think, you know, much of this is about, you know, I'll certainly say, um, you know, we didn't have recycling for three months in Baltimore City. Um, that was pretty bad if you are a consumer constituents. Um, and so, you know, the people who are losing out uh, because our recycling programs are so underfunded, consumers, you know, it's us, it's my kids. <laughs> We're the ones at the end of the day, whether, you know, through high taxes now or the litter and waste that we're seeing in our world tomorrow are the ones who are, who are being negatively impacted. So, at, okay, Neil? You're, you're muted, Neil. I will eventually learn that. Yep. Um, thanks, for all these, <laughs> thanks for all these comments. Um, I want to uh, pick up, uh, just mention a couple of things that Chaz said. Um, we, a lot of details have to be worked out. People like Chaz and the industry need to be involved. <clears throat> and secondly, uh, this is going, I believe this is going to uh, overall reduce, uh, reduce costs. Uh, but I want to uh, pinpoint something that uh, the delegate mentioned, and that is, um, uh, it, de it deals with what Chaz said too. You need people, talented people to run these things. I agree with Chaz, five people might not be enough. But the point is that under a program like this, we will start having career people in government agencies, whether it's MES, whether it's uh, local uh, working people working for Michelle, et cetera, at the local level. And that is critically important. One of the main uh, 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 areas of resistance in British Columbia um, is that the, uh, the monopoly, the corporate monopoly is so powerful and the local government and even provincial government don't have the staff or the expertise to counterbalance information that's coming in uh, from monopolies, literally. So I think uh, the delegate really has a very good point here in that we will build up a cadre of professional public servants who can, uh, who can undertake these issues, which are very complicated. But we need people speaking for the public and they need to be trained and hired. So I, I see this EPR bill filling many, many roles uh, as, as we, we all seem to have consensus on this. Good, good point, Neil. Uh, another question from the audience. Um, at the end of the day, how will we know we succeeded? What, what's the metric or what are the metrics against which the, the, the success of this program will be measured? Well, I think it, the long-term program success, would, you would see, um, we would see 
better recycling facilities. <laughs> we would see upgraded recycling facilities. We would see less trash and less waste. We would see you know, uh, DPWs and MD and uh, departments of the environment with a higher, you know, more flexibility. We would see consumers who, um, uh, we would see consumers who are seeing less trash, maybe reduced fees, or if even if they were paying the same fees, they would get a lot more bang for their buck. <laughs> you know, they'd see real improvement in services because it wasn't just all on them and their fees and taxes supporting the program. Um, I think we would see more robust recycling facilities around the state of Maryland. We would see, you know, haulers and waste management all working together through this process. Um, higher recycling rates, um, less trash going to our incinerators. Our incinerator, you know, I will say wheel liberator actually, we are not often on the same side, but we are on the same side on this because they get a lot of stuff that they don't want. <laughs> um, and so I think Overall, we just have a more holistic solution. And then my hope as well, of course, would be that the fees would be structured in a way, and I believe this is the case, MDE would approve the fees being structured in a way that the products that are coming in and being sold in Maryland would be more, e would be more easily recycled. Um, we would also see um, post-consumer content higher in products that were coming into the state of Maryland, right? So a lot, I think we would, we could see some big changes over the long haul, I, but you, you know, and you have to start somewhere. This is not an overnight, this is not something that's going to happen overnight, um, but it is something that if we don't start moving forward soon, we're, you know, every year is a big loss and every year more single use plastics are being created and more huge plastic plants are being, uh, being created and built around the country. So this is something that I feel is an urgent issue that we need to really get a handle on sooner rather than later. So do we have any empirical evidence uh, of, of quantifiable outcomes that we can see in other places where EPR has been instituted, where X amount of income and effort was in, in, in put into the system and the result was uh, X plus <laughs> something, a number, um, I mean, words like higher and more are all great numbers, but they're kind of vague. And as sure, no, there's, I don't have them in front of me, but there's a lot, there are so, there have been so many studies on European models, on the European models and the ca Canadian models. So there are multiple reports. I would point folks to the Product Stewardship Institute's reports. Um, PSI has done a number of reports demonstrating them. Um, and so I'm sure, yes, there, there are clear numbers and clear models out there. I just don't have them on me right now. Okay. With all due respect to Delegate Learman, I would very politely disagree. Uh, the OECD has conceded there's been no significant waste reduction in Europe, no product change. Uh, you see none in Canada. Uh, it gets into something that none of us really understand, which is what is the relationship of the, the EPR charge on a pack on a product, uh, the EPR charge on a package to the overall cost of the product. How does it fit into that much larger pricing situation? And the unfortunate reality, for better or worse, is that the lighter the material, the less it's going to end up paying on a per unit basis. And the reality is that the, it's, it's a group called the European Court of Auditors. It's their version of the Government Accountability Office. Uh, has re released a report several months ago pointing out that Europe will not meet its plastic recycling goals in 2025. And that when a new set of plastic recycling rates or, or guidelines for estimating the rate are, are come into effect at the end of this year, the actual plastic recycling rate in Europe will go down by at least 25%, maybe more. It's a very stubborn problem. Uh, they've had eco-modulation fees in France since 2011. And the main effect of them seems to be resulting in new ways to try to fine tune the program. Uh, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a very hard challenge. It is. And I'll just say, fortunately, our bill isn't modeled off of the European and Canadian models, right? We have our own. But, but, but experience is experience when it comes to eco-modulation fees. That, that's all I'm saying. So just FYI, Nathan posted a link to the OECD uh, evaluation of their EPR program, the European EPR program in the chat, if everybody wants to take a look at that at some point or other. We'll share uh, the a highlight or summary of, of the chat comments uh, when we send out the link to the, the recording after the event is over. So we've got about two minutes left here. I just want to see anybody else from the panel have a particular comment or question you think we need to 
to address before we, we move on. And, and recognizing that this is just the beginning of the conversation. Uh, I think we all recognize we've got a, a good ways to go here before we get someplace. So anybody? Yeah, I'll just jump in real quick. Uh, this is a great discussion. I think a couple takeaways. One, we don't have all the answers right here. I think what the delegates bill does is start the conversation and bring in the manufacturers who are not part of the conversation in a structured way. Um, in terms of metrics, you know, there's a lot of studies out there that's not for here, but I have two metrics right here. Zero dollars per ton, $270 a ton. You know, this is um, every day, you know, at, at, at Armour here and not dissimilar. And uh, we're talking about metrics, what people can see, but also what they can see. When we go to the store, we don't know which one is recyclable. You know, by having a structure where only recyclable or higher value commodities are available, it makes the consumer do the right thing when the consumer doesn't have to do you know, resin chemistry tests on everything they purchase at the grocery store. That's a great point. And that brings the consumer very nicely into the conversation, Adam. Thank you very much. So well, I wanna, Peter, want can to- I, Can I end us on one positive note? Absolutely. Uh, it is very clear that prices for recycled paper are going up. I'm starting to see those paper, those articles in the press. It's a, it's a reaction to uh, the expansion of domestic recycled content capacity in the United States, which the Northeast Recycling Council has been doing uh, some very good studies on, uh, showing that expansion. Uh, the price of pulp is going up in the world. Uh, so actually, I think since paper is what carries recycling programs, it's 60% or so of what you collect. And since Montgomery County is wise enough to have a dual stream program, so we have nice clean paper to sell, uh, that side of the equation is looking good and will look good for the rest of this year and hopefully on uh, the next two or three years to follow as those prices uh, solidify. Excellent, thanks Chaz. And let's go with one poll now and see, have we changed any minds? Based on what you heard today, do you think EPR is a viable option for Maryland? Okay, so it looks like the yeses are doing a little better this time around. But there's still a lot of maybe floating there. Um, popcorn's popping. Microwave's starting to get quiet. I'll give it another couple seconds here. And then we'll share the results with everybody to see where we are. Okay, let's let's see what we got here. So it looks like yes is, is ahead, but again, I think it was 54% uh, first time around. It bumped it up to 55%. So Delegate Learman, you you've taken 1% of our audience and you've turned them into true believers. So thank you very much. Um, so before we go, uh, a couple things. Uh, first of all, we need to laugh, right? Life's, life's too important to be taken seriously. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to give a big shout out and a great thank you to Delegate Learman for coming, joining us today and sharing the, the bill. And I want to share uh, my, my great appreciation for all the panelists who participated as well. So how about a big round of applause for everybody on the stage? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Remind everybody as well that we have this conference coming up maybe in June, maybe the Thursday, the June the 24th, but sometime in June, there will be a conference, virtual or in person, if remotely possible. And remind you, last of all, uh, if you're not a member, again, <laughs> we depend upon members to, to do the things that we do here. So uh, please join today, uh, support recycling in Maryland. We all want to move the conversation forward as much as we can. And with that, I'm going to let everybody go back to lunch, work, uh, the, the pool, whatever you were doing before you got here. And thanks again to everybody for, for joining us. The recording will be posted sometime in the next couple of days and we'll send out an email uh, as well. So thanks very much. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Peter and Chaz. Appreciate it.